Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, a long time uh, that, uh, that I have done a webinar. I think it's two years now, but I'm I'm very pleased to have a, a, a guest. I I treasure a lot. I have uh, Cosmos Darwin. Um, I will show our faces. Uh, <laughs> hi, Cosmos. Hey, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, and Cosmos will present in a minute uh, what's new in uh, Azure Stack HCI 23H2. That is hopefully coming soon. Yeah, but uh, before we do that, I will um, I will uh, take the time and give you uh, a little bit information. Where is my PowerPoint? Here it is. So I have to find my PowerPoint. Um, and I will give you a little bit information about three things I have done with a friend of mine, Bernard Frank. Uh, he is from the Microsoft Fast Track team, and uh, we did three video series that are available on YouTube. Um, the first one is how you install Azure Stack HCI uh, 22H2, and uh, Cosmos will tell us maybe about the future of the installation of uh, Azure Stack HCI very soon. Uh, but here is a, a 23 uh, videos where you can uh, how you can do that. It's more than six hours. Um, if you want, you can take a picture of the screen, but the video will be uh, uh, available uh, right after the uh, the presentation on YouTube. And we did another uh, series, an 18 video series about how to. Uh, uh, it's about Azure Virtual Desktop and Azure Stack HCI. How you can do it now and. There will be also also some changes. Maybe uh, Cosmos will talk about that. And the last one we did is an Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster series. Um, it's more than eight hours. I was I was shocked uh, when I added up the hours or the minutes. It's eight hours, and you can find it here. It's 17 videos, and we do some nice stuff, even uh, failing the cluster and so on. But now, oh, without further ado, let's switch to Cosmos, and you are here to hear all about the new uh, Azure Stack HCI version, and I'm now silent. So go on, Cosmos. And if you have questions, <laughs> ask them on YouTube, LinkedIn, or wherever. Thanks very much, Karsten. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and uh, watching this webinar. So it's, it's great to be back. I agree. It feels like it's been a long time since we did one of these. Uh, but there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot that's new. So uh, for those who have never heard of me before, hello. It's great to meet you. Uh, my name is Cosmo Star, and I lead the product management team for Azure Stack HCI at Microsoft. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had our big event, uh, our big annual launch event, uh, Microsoft Ignite. And we introduced our latest version of Azure Stack HCI, which is version 23H2. And so that's our, I guess, fourth annual version now. We had a version 20H2, 21H2, 22H2, 23H2. Um, and there's a lot that's new in this new release. Version 23H2 is, I think, our most significant update with the most significant changes and features, probably since the original version three years ago. Uh, and so I'm very excited to be here to be able to share some of that with you. And I'll try to get through the content uh, in, in not too much time so that if there are questions, we can answer those. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to make sure that everyone gets the information that they need. So uh, here's the agenda for the next roughly an hour. Uh, I'm going to just very briefly give an overview of Azure Stack HCI, what it is, what is our sort of reason for building it at Microsoft. Um, once we're through that, I want to share a little bit about the sort of typical use cases that we're seeing customers use Azure Stack HCI, because uh, there's a very clear pattern, actually, that's coming, and I, I want to talk about that. Then we'll get into the real core of the presentation, which is what's new in version 23H2. So there are a number of new product capabilities, and I'll briefly touch on each of them at a high level. Uh, and then we'll close out with just uh, a note about the release schedule, because the public preview is available right now, actually, and it'll be GA pretty soon, so I'll share that. Uh, and then I want to point you to uh, a demo that you can watch on your own time if you're interested that uh, showcases a lot of these capabilities in 23H2. And like I said, finally, I hope we'll have some time at the end for some questions. So that's the agenda. Uh, without any further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing is sort of a quick overview of Azure Stack HCI and of our overall strategy uh, with Azure Stack HCI and with the Edge at Microsoft. Um, our ambition with Azure is to uh, be the world's computer. And what we mean by that is to provide a trusted, ubiquitous computing platform that gives all of the services that customers need uh, to 
you know, host the applications and develop the applications that they need to run wherever they need to run them. And in particular, uh, we've really evolved our thinking over the last maybe five to 10 years away from thinking of Azure as just a hosted public cloud where Microsoft has some data centers and Azure just means workloads running in those data centers. And we think of it much more now as a continuous computing fabric that spans the cloud and the edge, where we as Microsoft have a responsibility to provide services for all the kinds of workloads that you need to run, whether that's virtual machines, Kubernetes clusters, SQL Server databases, um, you know, whatever the application or the type of workload is that you need to run, we have a service for that. Those services are then infused with intelligence so that you can derive insights from the data that's being generated by your applications and really use that to inform smarter business decision making. We have a set of developer tools and experiences, things like GitHub and all of the integrations that it has with Microsoft Azure to enable you to develop applications on top of the Azure platform. And all of this is contained within the security tooling and the identity tooling of Microsoft Entra and Microsoft Defender for Cloud and so on. And so this is, this is really what we think of as Azure. And it actually has very little to do with being in our data centers. And it's much more about these services, this data and intelligence, the security and identity patterns, and the developer tooling. And so our goal at Microsoft is to make all of this available wherever you need it, whether that is in a Microsoft data center or in your own data center or at the edge in a retail store on the factory floor or what have you. The technology that we're using to do that is what we call Azure Arc. Azure Arc is our bridge, our connector for bringing these capabilities from Azure and extending them to outside of a Microsoft data center so that you can use them on your own premises or at the edge. And I'll talk about you know, a lot of how we're doing that because Azure Stack HCI really is a core piece of this. Like Azure Stack HCI is designed to be the continuous computing fabric on which you can use Azure Arc and run all of these Azure experiences and services. So this is the reason that we're uh, doing this. And this is the strategy for us at Microsoft and at, in the Azure team, right? My team's part of the Azure team. Uh, we're trying to bring all of this capability to you wherever it is that you need. So I mentioned that Azure Stack HCI is a part of the solution here, and that's true. Uh, if you think about our solution stack at a very high level, uh, what, we're, what we offer as Microsoft is that you can select servers from your preferred vendor. That can be one of the large global OEMs or any number of other partners who provide the best service and support in your region. And on those bare metal servers, you can install our hyper-converged infrastructure stack, which is Azure Stack HCI. If you need container-based workloads, you can install the Azure Kubernetes service. And you can manage all of this, both the hyper-converged infrastructure, the Kubernetes, the virtual machines, and everything else through the Azure control plane through Azure Arc. And this is really our solution stack, both today and going forward. You can expect we're driving improvements and driving new capabilities into every layer of this picture over the years to come. So just very briefly about each of those sort of key pieces of the solution stack. Azure Stack HCI is our cloud-managed hyper-converged infrastructure solution from Microsoft Azure. It's a bare metal type one hypervisor. You install it on servers, it runs virtual machines. That's, I think, pretty familiar. Obviously, it has support for both Linux and Windows. It has built-in clustering for high availability. It has built-in software-defined storage and software-defined networking. It integrates natively with Azure Arc for management, and I'll talk a little more about that. And same as before, it scales from one up to 16 nodes per cluster. And with Azure Arc now, it's easier than ever to deploy multiple clusters and actually manage them under a common management pattern in the Azure portal. So that's Azure Stack HCI. I also mentioned the Azure Kubernetes service. And so AKS is an optional component that you can install on Azure Stack HCI if you need to run container-based workloads. And it's a managed Kubernetes application platform. What I mean by that is it's an AKS consistent, meaning Azure Kubernetes service in the cloud consistent Kubernetes solution that is managed in the sense that we as Microsoft provide built-in Linux and Windows container host images that you can use. We have CSI and CNI drivers so that those images can be used with, for example, storage spaces direct, and you don't have to do a whole bunch of complicated hooking things up. Just like HCI itself, AKS integrates natively with Azure Arc, so you can manage it through the Azure cloud. 
And it's managed in the sense that gestures like scaling, upgrading, rotating certificates, those kinds of gestures are actually performed automatically by the AKS infrastructure. This is not uh, something that you as the administrator have to take care of, uh, which is, those are what makes it challenging usually to use a Kubernetes solution if it isn't managed. And this entire solution of AKS is secured and supported top to bottom by Microsoft. So even though it includes a Linux container host, for example, it includes a number of open source components as well as components that we develop at Microsoft, uh, we secure and support the entire solution, including those open source components for AKS. And all of this I mentioned integrates with Microsoft Azure. And so this is a little bit of an, art, an eye chart, but I think the, the key you know, takeaway here is uh, on the, on the left-hand side, we have uh, components that run inside of a Microsoft data center. So this includes things like the Azure portal interface, the management services like monitor, defender, backup, update management. And on the right, we have things that actually run on your location, whether that's a data center or at the edge or what have you. And there's agentry that integrates every layer of the stack with the management tools and services in Azure Cloud. So there's a resource provider that integrates the Azure Stack HCI hypervisor itself directly into Azure. Similarly, there is an, a connected machine agent that runs in every virtual machine and connects it into uh, the hybrid compute provider in Azure so that it, it can interact with these Azure services. And there's even agentry that runs inside of Kubernetes uh, to project each of your Kubernetes clusters into the Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes cluster resource provider. This is what enables all of these management services, things like just typing in a search in the Azure portal and seeing all of the things that you have at the edge. This is what makes that possible because every layer of the solution, the infrastructure, the Kubernetes and the virtual machines is all connected directly back into the Azure control plane. And this is really powerful. This is the foundation for what enables you to use those consistent set of tools from the cloud outside of the cloud at the edge as well, which as I said at the beginning, that's that's really the core of our strategy here. I have a screenshot just to help make it real. So this is like just one example of what it looks like to manage Azure Stack HCI in the Azure portal. Uh, but what you can see here is, and if, you're, if you use Azure, this will be very familiar, I think. We're looking at a virtual machine. You can see at the top, uh, in the top left, that the resource type here is a virtual machine with Azure Arc. And the kind, if you look over on the right, is an Azure Stack HCI virtual machine. But other than those clues, everything else on the screen looks just like it's a virtual machine running in Azure. You have the same services in the left menu. You have security, policies, machine configuration, auto-manage, the ability to do update management, the ability to do monitoring through Azure Monitor. Uh, all of these things are installed as extensions, which you can see in the bottom right. In this case, we have the Azure Monitor agent extension installed. All of this looks just like this virtual machine is running in the Azure cloud, but it's not. It's actually running on, on your premises. It could be in your data center or it could be at the edge. And Azure Arc and Azure Stack HCI are providing an Azure-like management experience by connecting those resources back into the management services that you would use in the cloud. So that I think you know kind of summarizes our entire strategy in one picture uh, for how you can manage edge resources as if they were cloud resources. Uh, I'm very, very sort of proud and humbled that uh, our strategy here and our success so far has been recognized by uh, analysts in the industry. So uh, in particular, the most recent Magic Quadrant from the analyst firm Gartner uh, recognized Microsoft as the leader for distributed hybrid infrastructure. And that is a recognition of both our strategy and our ability to execute with products like the Azure Stack HCI and Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Arc. Uh, and yeah, we were recognized very clearly for our leadership position here, which we're very grateful for. So that's at a high level, an overview of our strategy with Azure Arc, with AKS, with Azure Stack HCI, and of sort of how those products work and how they fit together, just at a very high level. I wanna get into a few other things now. Uh, first, how customers are using these products today. What are some of the patterns that we see? And then, uh, most exciting, I want to talk about all the changes that are new in 23H2 to really enable the patterns that we're seeing. So I want to use uh, just a few sort of anonymized examples of deployments that we have uh, seen from customers that have been very successful using this, this solution. Uh, and I want to do this because you'll see that there's a very clear pattern that emerges. And a lot of the product changes that we've made in version 23H2 
are intended to serve this pattern, to make this pattern of usage easier. And that pattern is the distributed edge use case. That's what we call it, at least within Microsoft. So here are a few examples of customers. You'll see there's some things that are different. There's some things that are common. We have a customer in the energy sector. They're based in Italy. They've deployed 20 Azure Stack HCI clusters. They're a mix of two nodes and three nodes. And they're uh, each in a different physical location at an energy production site running container-based workloads, Kubernetes-based workloads that support the operations of those uh, oil and gas production sites. And they've deployed, like I said, 20 clusters so far. Another customer in a different country in a different industry, but similar pattern, uh, is a retail customer in France. They have 60 retail store locations, and they've deployed a two-node Azure Stack HCI cluster into each of those retail stores. And in their case, they're just running virtual machines. They have a set of virtual machines that they need to run in every location. This includes their point of sale application, uh, a system center distribution point, and a number of other apps. I believe there's a print server. Anyway, this customer has put a two-node solution, very small, in each of those 60 stores. They're all in different physical locations, uh, but they're all identical, and they're, they're very consistent in terms of how they run the infrastructure that supports the operations of the store. And the third example I want to give is a manufacturing customer based in Sweden. So again, different industry, different country. Uh, in this case, they've deployed uh, 40, in fact, I think it's now 45 factory locations. And depending on the size of the factory, they either have two nodes or three nodes or four nodes or even eight nodes uh, of Azure Stack HCI running a mix of virtual machines and container-based workloads in each factory location to support the operations of the factory. And that includes for example, a smart factory initiative where they're pulling additional data and telemetry off of the industrial machines running in the factory and driving insights from that. So you can see there's some, there's some differences between these customers in terms of the workloads they need to run, in terms of the industry that they're part of, but there's also a lot in common. Each, each of these customers has many individually small locations where they have deployed hyper-converged infrastructure to support the operations of those locations. Right? So these are not what you would think of as core data center workloads, really. These are not things that you could move to the public cloud. These are workloads that need to run at the edge close to physical operations, whether that's in you know, energy or retail or manufacturing. And this pattern continues, actually, the more of our customers you look at. And so here are another set of examples. We have a banking customer based in Switzerland, a logistics customer based in Denmark, uh, another retail customer, this time a supermarket chain based in Australia. And in each case, they've deployed um, individually modest sized infrastructure, but to many, many different locations, uh, wherever it is that they operate. And so in the case of the logistics provider, for example, those, those clusters are all three node Azure Stack HCI clusters. Each of them is three. And they're actually running on uh, ships, on, on boats that move around. In the case of the supermarket chain, the clusters are two nodes, different hardware vendor, different set of requirements. Um, but they're running physically inside of the supermarket to provide an in-store customer experience that really sort of innovates the retail experience for their customers. So you can see across all of these examples, the common pattern is it's this distributed edge use of technology. It's really bringing additional technology, whether it's into the factory or into the retail store or into the clinic or even into like a moving vehicle and having individually small applications uh, that run across many, many instances of uh, these locations, whether that's multiple stores or multiple factories or multiple boats. And so I wanted to highlight this because it's a very clear pattern that we see when we look at our product telemetry, when we look at our, our sales opportunities, frankly, with Azure Stack HCI, we see this very clear pattern. And almost all of the features in version 23H2 are designed to make it easier to do this. So this is really the type of scenario that we've been focusing on and that I think 23H2 is much, much better for than previous versions. So with that set up, let's get into it. Let's talk about what's new in version 23H2. Uh, there's quite a lot that we have changed. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is I think our probably our biggest product release since our original release in, in 2020. So let's just start. Uh, the first thing, and it's the first thing that you'll experience chronologically too, if you use the project or use the product. Uh, the first thing we've done is we've changed how Azure Stack HCI is deployed. There is a new and much simpler way to create an Azure Stack HCI cluster 
that is actually driven out of the cloud control plane. And so to create an Azure Stack HCI, uh, you now uh, connect the in servers individually up to Azure Arc. That's relatively straightforward. It doesn't require fancy storage or networking connections or anything like that. Uh, and then once each of the machines is registered with Azure Arc from Azure in the Azure portal control plane, you can go uh, configure how you want to deploy Azure Stack HCI onto those machines. You can specify all of the clustering details, the storage configuration, the networking configuration, and then initiate that from the cloud and push all of that down onto the machines that are running at the edge. The reason this is so powerful is, of course, you can use the Azure portal, which is what I've shown on the screen here. But more importantly, you can use a template. So you can capture all of the responses that you would put into the Azure portal as an Azure Resource Manager template. And then you can use that template over and over and over with different parameter files to create multiple Azure Stack HCI clusters with the same configuration as each other. And you can, in that way, you can be sure that they're being deployed consistently and correctly because the cloud is actually just deploying the same resource using the same template over and over and over. This was not something that we offered previously. And this is very, very helpful when you're deploying, like in the case of that supermarket chain, 600 clusters. Um, you, you need to be you know, using automation to make sure that that's done consistently. The other piece of the, of the problem, of course, is once you have deployed many, many you know, Azure Stack HCI clusters, you also need to keep them up to date. And so with version 23H2, we have a native integration between Azure Stack HCI and the Azure Update Manager in the Azure Cloud. So you can easily go into the Azure portal and select one or more importantly, select many Azure Stack HCI clusters, and then initiate an update of the full software stack, including the operating system, including the Kubernetes, everything, with just one gesture in Azure Portal. Uh, behind the scenes, it's the same cluster-aware updating technology that's being used to actually apply the update on each of the clusters. Uh, but what's, what's happening that's new is essentially orchestration over top that enables you to uh, scale easily to tens or even hundreds of cluster locations by selecting multiple of them and invoking the update from the cloud. We also uh, wanted to make it just easier to set up all of the infrastructure that's needed to then manage at scale. Because once you've deployed your Azure Stack HCI clusters, uh, the next thing you're going to need to do is actually deploy applications. Whether those are VM-based applications or container-based applications, you're going to have to deploy those across tens or hundreds of locations. And so uh, one of the things that's new in version 23H2 is that all of the infrastructure required to deploy virtual machines or to deploy Kubernetes clusters through the Azure control plane is set up automatically as part of deploying Azure Stack HCI. So you no longer need to go manually configure additional components. Uh, they're all built in when you create a cluster with version 23H2. And so specifically, when you deploy a new 23H2 cluster, uh, the Azure Arc resource bridge, the agents that are needed for the resource bridge, such as the mock node agent and mock cloud agent, uh, the custom location resource in the Azure cloud, all of those things are automatically provisioned for you so that as soon as your deployment is complete, you are ready to begin provisioning workloads. And so you can go to the Azure portal and create a virtual machine or, and you're probably seeing the pattern here, or even more importantly, you can go use an ARM template to deploy the same virtual machine across many, many Azure Stack HCI locations. We took this approach with virtual machines, but we also took the exact same approach with Kubernetes clusters. So all of the infrastructure that you need to deploy a container-based workload and a, a, a Kubernetes cluster running on the hybrid Azure, Azure Kubernetes service is also set up automatically as part of a new deployment of Azure Stack HCI version 23H2. So when you create a new HCI cluster, the hybrid Azure Kubernetes service is already set up and installed and ready for you to create your first Kubernetes cluster. So you can go to the portal and just click Create, and you're ready to go. Similarly, AKS clusters, just like virtual machines, are modeled in the Azure Resource Manager as first-class Azure resources. So of course, you can templatize the two. So you can use an Azure Resource Manager template and create the same Kubernetes cluster with the same container-based applications across many, many different locations of Azure Stack HCI. I'm sure you're seeing the pattern. All of these features are really designed for this distributed edge use case. Now, they can be used in other scenarios as well. It's not like they're only useful there. Uh, but when you put them all together, it makes it so much easier 
to manage tens or hundreds of locations where you have Azure Stack HCI clusters. Uh, under the hood, we made some, some pretty significant architectural changes, which might not be immediately obvious when you use the product, but they, they really do make a big difference in terms of the capability of the product. Uh, one of those changes, which I want to highlight, is a resource modeling change that we made for virtual machines and Kubernetes clusters when they run on the Azure Stack HCI. Uh, previously, uh, you could represent workloads running on multiple different infrastructures in the Azure control plane through Azure Arc. So for example, you could take a virtual machine running on Azure Stack HCI, see that in Azure. You could also take a virtual machine running on VMware and see that in Azure. But when you did that, they had different resource types. So one of them uh, would have different methods and different properties than the other, and they were not quite the same. Uh, we've unified all of this so that machines running anywhere, whether they're running on Azure Stack, whether they're running on VMware, whether they're running on some other cloud, for example, or even if it's a physical bare metal machine, they are all represented in Azure using the same resource type with different extensions. As a result, all of the services that you want to use, like Monitor, Defender, any of the value-add services that you would associate with virtual machines, those now work across all of the types of machines that you can connect to Azure Arc. So Defender for Cloud, for example, is one of the most popular services. We had gotten a lot of feedback that customers were eager to be able to use Defender for Cloud. Uh, and it's available now on virtual machines on HCI and on virtual machines anywhere, because all of the virtual machines use the same common resource model. So this was a huge engineering effort for us. It's not something you really see when you look in the Azure portal, uh, but under the hood, it's what provides that consistent, ubiquitous cloud to edge computing fabric and the same consistent set of services across all of these resources. Another big change in version 23H2 is that by default, when you do a new deployment, it is in a very secure configuration. So instead of just providing security options that you can configure to be secure, we've actually put all of those options to their most secure values by default out of the box. And uh, if you do a comparison between this year's version 23H2 and the previous version 22H2, we've actually increased by approximately double the score that uh, you have out of the box on the Azure security baseline. So previously you would get about a 50 or I think maybe 48% compliance relative to the Azure security baseline. Uh, now, this year, when you do a new deployment of 23H2 with no customizations, no overrides, nothing complicated, you do not need to be a security expert, uh, you will score almost 100% on the Azure security baseline out of the box because all of the security settings have been set to their most secure value. So this includes things like hypervisor-based code integrity, um, DMA protection, secured boot, um, disabling insecure protocols, like old, old versions like TLS one, you know, and so on. All of these things have been uh, configured carefully so that you are in a secure posture right away. This is really nice because if you're like me, you don't know all of the advanced security options, uh, but you, you, know that they're important, and this saves you from needing to go learn about them and configure them all yourself. So with previous versions of the product, we had a long security best practices guide. You don't really need to read that guide anymore. If you deploy, it is secure out of the box. We've also introduced a new security capability for virtual machines. So everything I just described is really related to the infrastructure. When you deploy a virtual machine, uh, you can now choose the security type to be Azure Trusted Launch. If you're familiar with Azure in the public cloud, this is an option that's been available for a few years. So you can choose the security type to be either standard or trusted launch. And now we've brought that advanced trusted launch capability to the edge as well. So when you deploy a VM on Azure Stack, it can work the same way as it does in the Azure cloud. A trusted launch VM has a, a virtual TPM, the trusted platform module, assigned to it. And that VTPM, what's very cool is it actually does not impede the mobility of the virtual machine. So the virtual machine can still fail over automatically between nodes. It can still live migrate seamlessly between nodes within the same cluster, even though it has a virtual TPM assigned to it. And that VTPM enables secure boot for the VM. It also enables applications inside of the VM to store secrets and certificates and keys inside of that virtual TPM and store them securely. So that means things like BitLocker, for example, are now possible inside of these guest virtual machines. And that's great if you're doing scenarios like 
end user computing and you have Windows 11, for example, or if, you know, if you're using SQL Server with some very sensitive information running on a Windows Server virtual machine, these are all scenarios where being able to use a TPM and being able to use um, security technologies like BitLocker and Secure Boot is very, very valuable. So that's possible now, and when you do it, the virtual machines still have the mobility that you expect, even if they didn't have a BTPM. So that's Trusted Launch. You'll see when you create a virtual machine in the Azure portal, it is one of the options. Uh, it's, it's very easy. It's not complicated. Just choose the security type to be Trusted Launch, and off you go. Azure Stack HCI for several years now has integrated with Azure Monitor for monitoring at scale. So you've been able to upload logs from the edge into an Azure Log Analytics workspace, and then you can use the tools in Azure to perform analysis on those logs and drive insights about what's going on with your hyper-converged infrastructure. This year, we've taken a significant step to deepen that integration and make it easier and more, uh, more capable in terms of what you can do. So instead of just integrating with logs, uh, there are now native Azure metrics and Azure alerts that flow from Azure Stack HCI directly into Azure Monitor. This is all customizable. This is all configurable. You can turn it off. Let me say that clearly. Uh, but I don't think you'll want to because it's very, very cool and very, very powerful what you can do with it. Uh, there are now over 50 standard metrics. These are included for free, by the way. They don't cost extra money in Azure Monitor. Standard metrics that cover everything from CPU performance to memory performance. Um, network bandwidth, RDMA bandwidth, storage IOPS, storage throughput, storage latency, like all of the quantities that you would want to monitor for hyper-converged infrastructure, all the same things you would see in a tool like Windows Admin Center, for example. All of those are being transmitted into the Azure Cloud as standard metrics. And then you can use the very powerful visualization tools in Azure to perform analysis. And you can even use Azure Alerts to set thresholds. So you can say, if IOPS ever drops below a certain limit, or if the average latency is ever greater than some threshold for more than one hour, you can trigger whatever outbound action you want or whatever um, remediation action you want. So you have the full flexibility to configure any of these metrics, set any thresholds or logic you want, and then run, for example, like outbound integrations like send me a Teams message or send me a ServiceNow request or send an email to this a group of administrators when this alert is triggered. And all of that is configurable without you having to do anything uh, terribly, terribly fancy or complicated because the metrics are flowing natively into Azure associated with the HCI cluster resource. And by the way, in addition to you being able to configure alerts, all of the infrastructure alerts that are actually built into the product, so like a disk failed or a server failed, or those all automatically flow into Azure alerts as well. And you don't have to set those up at all. They're just provided out of the box. So it's a much more complete and much more uh, powerful integration between Azure Stack HCI and Azure Monitor. And uh, this is based on a lot of feedback we've gotten over the last couple of years. So I think if you've tried the Azure Monitor integration, you're probably going to like these changes in 23H2 that make it a lot more useful. These changes also make it possible to do pretty deep and in-depth monitoring of specific product capabilities in Azure Monitor um, you know, all the way down to the hypervisor level. So I'll use one example here, which is in Azure Stack HCI version 23H2, we have a new deduplication and compression technology that the storage team has been developing for many years based on feedback about how you, know, you want it to work. This new deduplication and compression is natively built into the file system, and it does not have a chunk store at all. So the performance is actually much better and much more consistent than our previous deduplication implementation, which we've had for many years now. So this is an all new approach for deduplication um, that is intended to be better and provide better performance for active workloads. So uh, previously, you know, we kind of discouraged using uh, deduplication with say virtual desktop infrastructure because that's an active workload and it's kind of always running. Uh, this new dedupe is designed exactly for that. But you don't just want to take my word for it. You probably would want to evaluate the performance and be able to see it very clearly and form an opinion for yourself. And you can do that with Azure Monitor. And that's what's so cool about this is all of the information that you might want or need about deduplication flows from the Azure Stack HCI layer up into the Azure portal. And actually, we provide a built-in insights page that will show you the performance and the savings and whether compression is on or off and information like that. You can see every 
dedupe run and how much space was saved and how long it took. All of that information is available directly in the Azure portal. So it's very easy to see that and to understand even fairly advanced and fairly low level technologies in the stack like deduplication and compression. And I alluded to virtual desktops so that I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the Azure Virtual Desktop service. And Karsten mentioned this at the beginning as well. AVD, Azure Virtual Desktop, is a cloud-hosted app and virtual desktop service. Uh, it's proving to be incredibly popular in the hosted scenario where it runs in the Azure data centers. Uh, and we're very excited to be bringing that capability to Azure Stack HCI as well. So this solution has been in preview for some time. It will get to general availability at the same time as version 23H2 gets to general availability. So just a few months from now, it is not far away. With Azure Virtual Desktop running on Azure Stack HCI, you get the same cloud-managed control plane and simplicity of AVD running in the public cloud, but with the ability to co-locate session hosts, meaning the, the VMs where the desktops and apps run, you can co-locate those at the edge, either closer to users for lower latency, or maybe even closer to legacy applications. Like if you have uh, virtual desktop users who need to access a legacy system, a legacy database or something, uh, you can now co-locate their desktops closer to that legacy system, which again will improve the latency and improve the overall performance that the user experiences. Uh, the benefits associated with Azure Virtual Desktop Service carry over to Azure Stack HCI. So for example, you can absolutely use Windows 11 Enterprise multi-session to get that uh, differentiated density. Uh, you can also assign GPUs to these virtual machines and provide uh, a graphics acceleration for very demanding applications like computer-assisted design or video editing. Uh, all of that is possible on ABD on Azure Stack HCI. And Karsten actually mentioned at the beginning that the provisioning experience, uh, he, you know, he recorded hours of video about how to do it. The team has been working very hard to make that simpler so that it hopefully takes fewer hours. And what you can see on the screenshot here is uh, there's a new integration directly in the Azure portal where when you are creating a virtual desktop session host pool in the Azure portal, you can choose. Do you want to deploy it to Azure? or do you want to deploy it to an Azure Stack HCI on your premises? And if you choose Azure Stack HCI, the whole rest of the experience is the same, but instead of provisioning a virtual machine through the Microsoft Compute Resource Provider in an Azure data center, it provisions it using the Microsoft Hybrid Compute Resource Provider in your data center. Uh, and you get a virtual machine on Azure Arc on Azure Stack HCI, and then you can use that for Azure Virtual Desktop Service. So this is in preview right now. It's going to be generally available uh, very soon at the same time as version 23 gets to general availability. So we're very excited about that. That is a quick look at some of the key things that are new in version 23H2. Uh, as I said, it's a pretty significant release. I think it's probably our largest release since our first release a couple of years ago. And there's a number of different capabilities here, things like AVD, things like deduplication. But the, the really common theme is we're trying to make it easier to manage at scale, tens or hundreds of factories, retail stores, you know, clinics, and so on, because that's the pattern we're seeing right now. Um, and that's the feedback that we've heard from you and from all of our customers about the improvements that you'd like to see. So there's just a few more quick things I want to briefly touch on, like release schedule, and then I am completely confident that we will end with some time left for some discussion or some questions, uh, if, there, if there are any. So release schedule. Uh, we are in public preview right now with Azure Stack HCI version 23H2. So everything I just showed, you can go try it today. It is available right now in a public preview. And it has been since Microsoft Ignite about two weeks ago. Uh, we are putting the finishing touches on a lot of these features. We're incorporating some feedback and some, some uh, bugs that we have found based on preview feedback. Uh, and we're working toward making this entire solution generally available in the first quarter of 2024. So just a few months away, it, it's not far. Uh, when it gets to general availability or, or GA, initially that will be for new deployments, meaning you can do a new deployment of version 23H2 and go into production with that. Um, it will not be offered right away for existing deployments of 22H2 to upgrade to 23H2. We will upgrade all or very nearly all 22H2 clusters to version 23H2 over the months that follow. So the team is hard at work right now on building that experience, 
validating that experience, confirming that upgrades do not cause problems. We take that very, very seriously. We do not want the upgrade to create a situation that is bad for you. Um, so the team is working on that. And after we make it generally available for new deployments in the first quarter of 2024, in the second or third quarter of 2024, we will make it available as an over-the-air update for everyone who has version 22H2 as well. And so uh, that'll probably go in waves. We will probably start with some uh, clusters that are easier to upgrade because of maybe they're smaller or they're not using certain features or what have you. Uh, and then over time, we will make that upgrade available to uh, as many clusters as we can. And our goal is to make it available to everyone. Uh, so that'll be in the sort of second or third quarter of the year. Uh, and then, of course, we'll get into our next big release and a similar schedule to what we had this year with uh, a version 24H2 and so on. So it's in public preview right now, and it's not long until it'll be generally available, just a couple of months. Very excited about this. The last thing, uh, I don't want to take the whole, like I have a, a demo that walks through all of the product capabilities I just described, and it shows how they all work together, and it can give you a much uh, more hands-on feel for like what are all of these capabilities and how, how are they used. Uh, it does take about 20 minutes to show all of those. And so I have a recording of this demo and uh, I will share the link and we can also, I'm hoping we can find a way to share the slides if that's possible. Um, and uh, this video is on YouTube, you can watch it. Uh, and in this demo, what we do is, is we, we basically take four retail store locations from a fictional retailer, and we deploy the entire infrastructure from, from the Azure Stack HCI to AKS to a virtual machine workload and a container workload across all four store locations. And we do that end to end in this video demo. Uh, so if you're interested, I invite you to check this out. Um, it's online. It's also embedded in our announcement blog. Uh, and I think it'll give you a really good feel for how these product capabilities work. Um, more than just the words I said today and the pictures I showed today. I mean, sh seeing it in action, I think will make it, it will help make it real. So I encourage you to go watch that, but I would rather prioritize discussion and Q&A as opposed to the video. So I'm not going to play the video. I'll just point you to it. Um, and then we can use the time that we have um, to do some discussion. So that is what I wanted to cover today. Um, thank you for listening. And also thank you to Karsten for having me. That's you know, a quick overview of our strategy of the typical use cases we're seeing of what's new in version 23H2 and when it's coming, which is just a few months from now for, for general availability. So with that, let me uh, open it up. Karsten, did you have um, questions or uh, things you want to talk about? Or were there any questions that were put in the chat or that you want to uh, pass through? I'm more than happy to stick around. Uh, Cosmos, you know, I, I always have questions, but we have uh, questions from the audience. So these Great. are, of course, first. Um, but uh, to be, uh, I know you have a hard cut at eight, yeah. uh, at uh, eighteen, so at the hour. So I first there was a question if the if this is recorded. Yes, after after the live session, it will be immediately uh, available uh, on uh, YouTube. Um, <clears throat> then then I will. Uh, show some questions. Uh, so uh, Robert was uh, asking, been trying to test 23H2 and then MS Lab environment, but always failed at the net ATC configuration. Seem, seems no issue mitigation. Uh, so I guess uh, in the moment we have the first step of the deployment from Azure and you are working on improving that because I had myself some, some issues with it. And uh, I, I guess uh, there is... Uh, an improved version coming. Have you uh, a date for that maybe or an, an uh, hint? Uh, yes. So one of the nice things is that we can improve uh, issues in the deployment experience much more quickly now because it's hosted in the Azure Cloud. So we can deploy pretty much any time. Um, I am aware that there are some issues. I don't know the specific details of this one. I apologize for that. Um, but the team sees every deployment attempt because, of course, right, it's flowing through the Azure control plane. And uh, we can see exactly how many of them succeed and how many fail. Uh, right now, I believe we're seeing first attempt success rate around 50%, and then eventual success is much higher. Sometimes you have to try a second time or a third time. Uh, needless to say, the team is very committed to driving that to the point where uh, most people succeed on the first attempt. And you know, sometimes if there's parameters that are wrong or whatever, it might take multiple attempts. 
Um, so we're constantly making improvements. I know there's a bunch of improvements that have already actually been put out there and there are more that are coming in early January, and mid January. And so every few weeks, the team is gonna be uh, trying to address the most common issues that we see based on the data, based on how many times did someone get stuck trying this deployment and hitting this issue. So I'm sorry that you hit an issue, um, but we're definitely working on addressing all of it. It's, it's oh, preview, it's, it's, not, it's not perfect yet. So <laughs> another question from Daniel. Um, I think this was interesting. Upgrading from Azure Stack HCI 22H2 to 23H2. Are there any technical changes on how to add the benefits to the local host VMs. Uh, uh, and I think they are, but I wanted to you ask, uh, answer the question. Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. So let me give a little context for everyone in case it's not clear. So um, in Azure Cloud, there are some benefits associated with workloads like Windows Server and SQL Server. For example, extended security updates are available at no additional cost when you move a, ver a, a Windows Server or a SQL Server into Azure Cloud. We have extended those same benefits from Azure data centers into Azure Stack HCI so that you can have them in your data centers too. And so if you lift and shift a Windows Server 2012, for example, onto Azure Stack HCI, you can get extended security updates for uh, at least three years, it might be four, at no additional cost because you've lifted and shifted that virtual machine onto Azure Stack HCI. And as Microsoft, we treat that just like you moved it to Azure. Okay. so. Daniel's question is about how do I actually enable, um, you know, receiving those extended security updates. Uh, in version 22H2, there was a mechanism that required essentially a virtual network interface to uh, attest into the virtual machine that it was running on Azure Stack and therefore it should be able to get the ESUs for free. Uh, there is a significantly improved mechanism in version 23H2, but it's not all good news, so hang on. Um, that new mechanism does not require a virtual network interface anymore. It uses the Hyper-V VM bus, basically uh, the ability to talk directly from the hypervisor into the guest if you enable integration services. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it provides attestation. The gotcha is that integration services themselves are actually not available on Windows Server 2012 because it's too old. So uh, this mechanism is this new mechanism that doesn't require a virtual network interface can be used for uh, activating uh, Windows Server Azure Edition, for example, for activating Azure Virtual Desktop. But it actually does not work for the ESUs on 2012 yet, because 2012 doesn't have integration services. In a few years, when we get to 2016 end of support, it will work. Um, but for <laughs> now, specifically for 2012 uh, and 2012 R2 ESUs, you do still need a virtual network interface. I'm sorry about that. Okay, there is another question from Daniel. I think that's also a good one. It came up when you talked about the security improvements. Uh, so a new 23H2 cluster will also uh, with all the uh, will all security options activated. Um, and he's asking if you have a 22H2 and upgraded to 23H2, what will happen then? Uh, has it to yeah. go to the new security? Maybe you don't know that yet because uh, the upgrade experience is later, right? We do actually. Though. Well, it's later, but I mean, uh, we're obviously building it right now so that we can okay. it in months. Um, we are not going to change all of the security settings by default when you do a 22 to 23 upgrade. So we will leave the settings the way that they are uh, we will upgrade the OS. We will install all of the resource bridge and um, other infrastructure that's needed so you get the full experience with creating VMs and creating Kubernetes clusters. But we're not going to go change all of the security settings. There's just too much risk that it disrupts something, right? Because we're turning off old protocols. We're adding uh, defender application control. Like There's all of these things that we would be turning on that are potentially disruptive. What we are doing instead is we're building an experience in Azure Portal where all of the security settings of an HCI cluster are surfaced in Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So you will be able to go to Defender for Cloud and see like, are all of the settings turned on? Do you have secure, um, secured core you know, satisfied all of the requirements? Uh, do you have you know, BitLocker on all of the boot volumes? Like All of those types of information will be surfaced in Defender for Cloud. And then you can choose if you're comfortable turning them on and you can turn them on. Um, but we will not automatically turn them on as part of the upgrade. We talked about this for, you can probably imagine, for many, many, many hours. And this was the conclusion we reached. 
<laughs> okay, I think it's a good one. So, uh, Carl uh, has some questions. Um, he was this question came up when you showed the the great experience uh, over the Azure uh, portal to deploy VMs, and he is asking if there will be also possibility to do something in uh, in uh, Windows Admin Center. Um, I guess not, but maybe you can clarify. Uh, you can. Uh, so, our our goal. I will be transparent. Our goal is to make it so that you do not want or need tools outside of the Azure tools to use you know, the product, to use virtual machines and Kubernetes. Um, but that is a long, multi-year roadmap for us. Um, there are still some options for things that you can do in other tools, like in Windows Admin Center, and that you cannot do in Azure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give an example. If you have two Azure Stack HCI clusters, and you want to initiate a live migration from one cluster to the other cluster, and of course that means also a storage migration, you can do that in Windows Admin Center today. You can go in, choose the VM, choose the destination, type in the machine name, and send it. There is no option for that in Azure yet. We're building it, but we haven't delivered it yet. Um, so for that reason, you absolutely can continue to use the tools like Windows Admin Center, like even PowerShell or Hyper-V Manager if you want, uh, because we know we have not delivered all of the capabilities in Azure. Our goal is to deliver them all, though, and hopefully in a few years, you won't want to use these other tools. But for now, I know you need them, and yes, you absolutely can use them. They're not blocked. They're not prevented. Okay. Carl also had a question when you showed the or talked about the new DDoP uh, functionality that is built in in the operating system, uh, and he asked about the transition from the current DDoP to the new DDoP. Um, I think that are two separate things, right? They are two different features. This is a good question, Carl. I have to be honest with you. I don't, I've don't. i never tried myself enabling the old dedupe and then disabling it and then enabling the new one. So it's a good question. Um, they are two different features, and they have two different sets of commands. So um, the new ones all say uh, REFS in the command. So you can do like get REFS dedupe volume, for example, in PowerShell and enable REFS dedupe. Um, so I think in terms of being able to tell which one you have enabled, if you read the documentation, and just it'll, it'll be fairly clear, I think. Um, but uh, there is not like a way to transform old dedupe into new dedupe, other than I would guess completely disabling the old dedupe and then enabling the new one. Um, and the new one is only on REFS. The old one was on NTFS or REFS, but the new one is only REFS because it's actually built in REFS. It's how it works. <laughs> OK. So. Um... I will ask a question that is, um, yeah, uh, Stefan, I know Stefan, he, he has an Azure Stack HCI implementation, a stretch class, I know him, and he's, uh, he's asking about the performance in, a, in, a, in, the, uh, in the replication. Uh, you are working on that, but you, are, you were not talking in, in 23H2 about that. So is there something coming? Are you still working on it or what's yeah. happening here? It's a good question. So the current uh, preview of version 23H2 has some limitations. Uh, for example, it does not support IPv6 very well. It's not available in China region yet. Uh, there's like a long list of like little things that we have yet to fix on 23H2. One of those is that the 23H2 preview also does not currently support stretch clusters yet. So uh, you can evaluate all of the features I described, but you actually cannot create a stretch cluster with 23H2 yet. Mm -hmm. um, we will have more to share in the, in the new year, in early 2024, about our roadmap for stretch clusters and our roadmap for uh, potentially alternate technologies as well. We've gotten a lot of feedback from actually Stefan, I think, among other people, about um, potential better approaches for uh, delivering a solution like stretch clusters. I know, Karsten, you flew yourself to Redmond just to yell at us about how you wish it worked. <laughs> yes, um, I was a bit yelling. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, I was very, I was very. Uh... It's opinionated great. about so it. We, we take that feedback very seriously, and uh, we have a team that is developing a future roadmap for stretch clustering here. And there's actually, I'm hoping we can make much more improvement than just the performance. I'm hoping we can improve the network design as well and other aspects. Um, but I don't have the details to share right now, unfortunately. We'll have more to share about that soon. Yeah. So I have one more question because I know you have to go in, uh, in some minutes. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, Again, from Carl, Azure Edition activation works well on GUI variants, but for core installations, activation is not cur uh, currently visible in Server Manager. Yeah. Is it fixed? Do you know that? I don't, actually, Carl. This is a, this is a good one. Um, I don't know if you filed the support 
incident for this or uh, it's it I, I apologize i have not actually heard of this specific problem before um you're right that i think when we do most of our testing internally for activating azure edition guests um now that we have hot patching on server full we actually do test it and mostly on server full um so i'm not familiar with this bug but um if you can file a support incident we can definitely follow yeah. up so there is just one uh, coming up from robert uh how far away is a new uh, cluster deployment arm template gui <laughs> yeah i think uh, it's so the new release right um, yeah, there's, well, there's two pieces here. Um, I, I assume this is similar to the question earlier about like how quickly are we able to react to issues and make changes and improvements. Um, so there's, there's two pieces. There's uh, the experience that's actually hosted in the Azure portal. That experience we change every couple of weeks um, and there isn't really a notification process for that. You'll just see improvements over time. Um, there is also the action plans that run uh, to actually like do the deployment and behind the scenes, by the way, these are, there's no magic. It's like a set of PowerShell scripts wrapped in an orchestration engine with retries and everything. Um, those we basically update once a month. So the next big update is uh, what you have right now is called version 2310. The next one is 2311. I believe it's coming next week. Um, that you can actually see by which version of the lifecycle manager extension you get. So. You may have noticed that when you do an Azure Stack HCI deployment from the cloud, one of the first things that happens is the Azure Edge Lifecycle Manager is pushed onto all of the machines, and then that's what does the deployment. Um, so that has an observable build number that you can see, and there's a new one every month, basically. Um, the portal itself, we can make like uh, UX fixes anytime. Uh, I think we can uh, get another question in. Um, so. Uh... Clong dive, whatever that means, are these new features exclusive to Azure Stack uh, HCI, or will they be coming in the data center Azure edition or regular data center edition at some point? Yeah, this is a good one. We're going to have, uh, I think, a lot of exciting stuff to share in 2024 about this. So next year is a big year. It's the year for the vNext of Windows Server. So uh, this was announced at Microsoft Ignite as well a couple of weeks back. There's Windows Server uh, vNext, which uh, is sort of the next LTSC every three years we have a major release. Um, we're trying to see how broadly we can make these capabilities available. And uh, it is easiest to deliver when the solution space is more constrained, um, but there, there are some things that we are trying to do and I'm hopeful that we'll be successful. And if so, we'll have more information to share about it next year. Um, but certainly I think some of this we will be able to bring to Windows Server. And I would love to do that. I'd love to make it available. Again, the whole strategy is make Azure available where you need it, right? Whatever is easiest, like we want to get it to you. Um, probably not all of it, just to be honest, but we're going to try and uh, we'll have more to share next year. OK, so uh, with that, um, I will uh, do a small announcement. But before that, I will. Uh, I want to thank you, Cosmos, for your time. I know you are very, very, very busy. Um, but there was no session about uh, Azure Stack HCI, unfortunately, on Ignite. Uh, but you will, uh, of course, share some more information in the future. So thank you, Cosmos. You have two minutes to your next very important yeah. meeting. Thank and I wish you a, And thank yeah, you, everyone, for, for joining. I appreciate and it. And I wish you a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we will see each other next year, I hope. And my uh, mine announcement is uh, early next year, I will also do a session with uh, Jeff Woolsey about what's coming in vNext. So also very interesting. And we will do a, a, a Windows Server uh, Summit in Germany, where we also talk about the great stuff that is coming in, in Win Windows Server vNext. And maybe about Azure Stack HCI, then it, I hope it's available I, I assume it's available in April, so we can share some information there. Cosmos, thank you so much, and uh, uh, go. That's uh, I will only share my screen now, and uh, will also thank uh, thank our uh, our uh, participants. Uh,
uh, to being here so late. It's uh, nearly six o'clock in Germany. I know uh, the timing is not perfect, but in, in Redmond, it's uh, now uh, nearly 10 a.m., so in the morning. So we have to, to find a, a time where uh, Cosmos is not sleeping uh, and we are still awake. So thanks so much and hope I see you in the next webinar that will be about uh, what's, what's new in Windows Server v Next that is coming out next year. Bye.